Hello and welcome to this special program. How is artificial intelligence, AI, going to change how we work and uh, how we conduct our lives? That's essentially the focus of this conversation over the next 30 minutes. And to help me do that, we are going to be speaking with the Chief Technology Officer at TCS, uh, Dr. Harris Wynn. Harris, it's great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. I think one of the things which uh, a lot of people, a lot of the audience uh, will believe and do believe, I think, uh, is that AI is a job killer especially IT services jobs, uh, and it's going to be a job killer. Let's just start there. Is that true? No, I don't think so. Actually, I look at AI as a technology that is going to augment people mm. rather than replace people. Mm. So when I say augment people, what I mean is they are it is going to make people do work much better than they are doing today, maybe perhaps faster, mm. but also actually deliver very different value. Mm. To the customers to, for whom they are doing work. So just to take an example, if you think about, let's say, contact centers or call center, AI will actually not only help a call center agent become much more productive by saying, for example, when I have had a call with you, mm. take the call transcript, summarize it, and actually automatically, let's say, derive um, the sentiment mm. that got exchanged during the call. Mm. AI will also help the contact center agent become far more contextually mm. aware. Mm. Who is Harik? Mm. What product has Harik bought in the past? Mm. Is he a happy customer? Which the person has to do manually right now. Yeah, today the person does not, in fact, yes, manually, and in fact the information is distributed all over many, many, many data sources within an enterprise. Right. Some right. of it is in CRM, some of it is in product uh, information and so on. Mm. How do you collate all of that and augment, improve my contextual awareness as right. a call center agent? Right. So that I can do what I do better. Mm. In future, it will actually allow me as mm. a call center agent to be far more proactive. Mm. Can I predict mm. or anticipate mm. the need for Harik to maybe call mm. and actually reach out to Harik mm even before Harry calls, mm. potentially, to mm. actually help improve the, mm. the s customer satisfaction, mm. right? So change this entire model from almost like complaints management right. to almost like value mm. management. Is that already happening though? I mean, St calling before uh, the customer has to call? I mean, just to use that example. It, to some extent, I think so. A lot of it is today happening f before you have sold a product or service. Okay. The question is after you have actually bought a product or service, right. can we actually, because the world is changing, there's so much instrumentation that mm. is there. In, I mean, if you think about a car, mm. the car is a heavily connected car today. Right. 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 So it is collecting so much information about the car, the driving pattern, wear and tear, and so on. So it is not that difficult to imagine a situation where the the car itself will be able to say that this is going to go wrong in 30 days mm. and even before I as a user come mm. to know about it so that then that yeah. you yeah. can actually do inbound. So in some sense thinking about contact centers not as call centers but mm. almost think of them as customer success centers. Mm is really sort of the type of transformation that is like. But the same number of people are going to be required. I mean, just to go to back to the first point and tie that off. For example, if you have 100 people and uh, you have these AI applications coming in, will you need all 100? Will you need 70? Will you need 50? Because productivity goes up, as you said. Yeah, productivity will go up for a certain class of jobs that mm. they are doing mm. that frees them up to do new jobs mm. that they are currently not doing. So, for example, from complaints management to customer success management, mm you're going to add a whole bunch of new jobs mm. that they will have to do. So in a sense, while you're releasing capacity, you're utilizing that capacity to change the value mm. perceived by customers. So in my mind, the number of people will not change, mm. but the jobs that they do mm. will fundamentally change. And the value that is perceived by the customers of that job will also change. And there is no people-free success centers, customer success centers. I no. Mean, you know, just completely automated. No, I, I think we are probably making a big mistake in thinking automation. So I, at least personally, I always think in terms of augmentation rather than replacement. Okay. There is plenty of work to be done that is not getting done today. Right, right. Which will, when you free up capacity to do work hmm. from existing set of workers, they will actually now start doing things that are not getting done today. Hmm. 
So this heavy retraining which is required, right? I mean, new training which is required yes. across the industry? Yes. Across all aspects, basically. Yes. So I think you're absolutely right. So the, the in a sense with AI, the roles of people mm. is fundamentally changing. Mm. From doers of work mm. to sort of trainers and interrogators of intelligent machines, mm. reviewers of work done by machines, mm. and actually owners of critical thinking, creativity, and things of that sort, right? Mm. Sort of design thinking. Mm. Which means that you will have to continuously retrain people. Mm. In fact, as machines will become more and more intelligent, the roles of people will keep shifting also constantly. Right. And right. new jobs will get added, as I said, the customer success mm. rather than uh, sort of complaints handling, right? right? So that will require continuous training and retraining. Mm. In fact, as we were discussing earlier, I think every skill that people are learning today their utility, sort of what is often called as a half-life of a skill, which is right. the time it takes a particular skill that you've acquired to lose half of its value, mm. is shrunk from almost 30 years to six, seven years today, and it's shrinking. Mm. Which means that all of our children will actually have to retrain themselves multiple times over during their career. And so the need for constantly retraining um, talent or mm. employee base mm. is going to become a critical success factor for every organization. But this has already happened or this has been this process, this half-life, I mean, the point that you make, is it, it's accelerated now because of AI? Yes. It is accelerating and it will probably keep coming down right. further. Right. So as technology is maturing, a lot of the hard skills mm. are actually, they're, they're, their half-life will keep coming down. Mm. Whereas, in fact, the need for a lot more of the soft skills, mm. being able to actually understand, articulate, coherently explain something, mm. critically analyze something. Mm. In software engineering, for example, the ability to read code and analyze code is going to become far more important moving forward than mm. write code. Mm. Absolutely. Because writing code will happen by machine. Mm. But once it has written some code, being mm. able to actually read that and mm. say, ah, this is good but not great. Mm. And here is the reason why it is not great. Mm. Let me go ahead and change it. Now, mm. so this is actually creating a almost a, a, a sort of a machine people co-working situation where machines will constantly augment people and make them better. Mm. And people will constantly make machines better. Mm. And that's sort of an almost like a hybrid workforce mm. where people and machines are sort of improving each other constantly will become the norm of the future. I got it. Uh, you know, just tell us the use cases of AI with a few examples if you can. And I'm not talking about TCS, but maybe you can sort of because you have a bird's eye sure. view of what's happening in the organization at TCS. And it's also kind of a prism into what's happening in the IT services industry. Sure. Uh, where is it being used? I mean, for our viewers, just to kind of understand uh, what sure. is it helping you do? No, so I think it is actually the, the technology is getting embedded in almost all what I would call as knowledge work. Okay. Um, and there are um, three broad categories, if you will, right. of use cases, right. or even you can think of it as maturity where technology is getting used. Mm. So if you think about all knowledge work today, it is actually has, uh, is a combination of people make decisions about mm. something, mm. and then operationalize decision, mm. those decisions, mm. using some sort of actions. Right. Right. So the first class of use cases are basically focused more on actions. Mm. Can I use AI or intelligent machines to perform certain tasks or actions for me? Mm. For example, going back to the example that we were talking earlier about in a contact center right. situation. Right. When a call came in, mm. today a call center agent has to actually, at the end of the call, write a call transcript and summary and say this is what happened. Mm. Now the machine will actually do that. So that's more automation, that. essentially. This is more automation right. and that improves productivity, right. which is focused on the actions. Okay. Uh, so in software engineering, if you think about that, then write code for me or write some test cases for me or things of that sort. Okay. That those are the kinds of actions. The second class of use cases are basically more augmenting mm. the work doer's contextual awareness. So okay. for example, if I'm writing a piece of code, mm. where does this piece of code fit in the larger software application that I'm actually building? Okay. And how is that actually getting viewed? Who is going to use this, how frequently is this thing going to call, what is the performance requirement of this, mm. 
all of that is contextual awareness because once I understand that, I will make the right decisions when okay. I'm building code, right? Okay. Similarly, uh, in, in a call center example, I mean, who is the customer, and okay. lifetime value of the customer, what is the potential next best offer or action that I should offer okay. to that customer? Sure. This is all augmentation. Okay. Which is helping people make better decisions. Right. So as to actually improve the quality of work output that they will generate. Sure. The third category or a maturity level is actually going to be taking these two sort of assist and augment mm. types of use cases, bringing them together to completely rethink the end-to-end -end value that is getting delivered. I, we call them as transform use cases. Okay. Where, so in the case of contact center, while the, the, the two types of use cases we talked about, they are going to assist and thereby improve productivity as well as augment the call center agents. The third category is where can we actually take the call center as an entire value chain mm. and completely redefine that value chain mm. where we will actually now, as we said earlier, proactively predict the need for mm. a customer requiring help or mm. service and mm. proactively offering that, mm. right? So can we turn something th today that is a more complaint or cost center mm. into much more of value center. Okay. Hereby shifting focus from bottom line, mm. a cost center focus to much more customer success and consequently top line focus. Okay. So that is the transform. So in software engineering, similar things will happen. Okay. Right. Instead of looking at only productivity improvement of certain types of activities like coding or mm. testing or things of that sort, can we build software such that you will uh, be able to build software that is near zero, let's say, operations by design. So mm. when you build software, mm. I've captured enough knowledge such that the operations of that software, which mm. is a sizable amount of work that happens today, mm. that is going to get automated by design or augmented by design so mm. that we can actually get people to do, build resilient software mm. much easier. And what is is uh, first use case, I'm assuming, is happening, right? Yes. It's in widespread. Fact, in what fact, about almost 70, 80, 90 percent of what's happening today is, I would say, assist. Mm. There is maybe 20 odd percent is today augment. Mm. Transform is very little mm. today, but that is where we expect actually the significant amount of, if there is knowledge work disruption that is going to happen, that will happen the moment you go to more of the transform type. The third stage. Third stage. But you Sort of a natural maturity or progression towards But we're not more. there yet. It's we are not there yet. We are not there yet. And this is true for the industry as, as well? Uh, across most of the industry, we are at, on, at, at level one, which is assist? Assist and augment is probably, I would say assist is 70, 80 percent, augment is maybe 15 percent, 20 percent. The, the transform is very, very low at mm. the moment. Uh, and you'll, you can apply this, I mean, uh, while we have been talking about contact centers and software engineering, I mean, you can think about marketing. Mm. You can think about um, uh, drug discovery, mm. Mm. right? I mean, you pick any domain of work or underwriting for mm. insurance or mm. risk management. Mm. All of this has exactly the same flavor mm. that you will actually start out with assist, mm. improving productivity of people. Then second level will be help people do what they do much, much, much better because you are helping them become far more creative in mm. a sense. Mm. Machines helping them to become more creative. And then eventually you sort of say, oh, we have created a whole bunch of these agents, mm. if you will, mm. that are augmenting or assisting people. Can sure. we combine this in what is now starting to be called as an agentic network? Mm. That together, can I completely redefine the value of that function? Sure. So uh, for example, the time to build, let's say, a new drug. Right. Can I shrink it for two years or three years to six months? Right, right. That is where the game will shift. Yeah, have the technology settled really, or is it still kind of, uh, and, and, and what's the pace of change here? extremely fast pace of change, it is not settled. In fact, every technology goes through in their life cycle, sort of an S-curve mm. kind of a principle. And so when we're talking about technologies, we're talking about AI technology. Yes, uh, yes. AI technology. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. Within AI, Gen AI, whatever okay. you want to call it. Okay. So we have, I think, taken a long time to get to it. Now it is rapidly, we are sort of the rapid rise part of the S-curve mm. right mm. now, where the technology is improving incredibly fast. If in fact, a new, 
LLM or a purposive LLM or industry specific LLM or even activity specific LLM is actually getting getting introduced every two weeks, mm. every week. Mm. So the and existing LLMs, mm. their sophistication is also increasing. So okay. the intelligence of models mm. as well as availability of new purposive models, both are actually improving very, very rapidly. So we are sort of in that rapid rise part of the S curve of mm. a technology mm. maturity. Most of, of this technology, and uh, just to sort of clarify one more thing, when we talk about AI, mostly and on the assist side, it's mostly we're talking about gen, uh, gen AI? No, actually, so, I mean, it's a great question. Actually, AI is not new, mm. right? I mean, AI has been around for a long time. Yeah. So, so there are sort of, or in general, if you say intelligence, mm. uh, there are sort of three types of intelligence. Mm. There's what we, I would call recognition intelligence. Mm the ability to actually extract information from unstructured sure. repositories, like take an image, there's a shape, it's an object, object is a dog, dog is a mammal. Right. That's all recognition intelligence, right? right? The second one is reasoning intelligence, mm. which is when I s observe a system mm. or let's say a traffic signal, mm. what is happening? Mm. Why is it currently, sure. there is a traffic jam now? Sure. So diagnosis, mm. So what is happening is what is called as descriptive reasoning, mm. diagnosis, mm. which is why is it happening, right. predictive reasoning, which mm. is what is likely to happen, right. and prescriptive reasoning, mm. what should what I should do happen. about it. Mm. So that's sort of the four levels of the, which is the second category. The third types of intelligence, which is sort of creative or generative intelligence, which mm. is now that I have done diagnosis or prediction, prescription, how do I translate all of that into action? Right. Right. right? So, in a sense, traditional AI was already doing a lot of the um, recognition, the recognition and reasoning. Right. Now we have added to it the generative or the creative capability, so that it has now become almost like a closed loop intelligence system. Right. Much like human brain. Right. right. So you have the ability to think, reason, and carry out that action, and that is what is sort of generating a lot of excitement now. Right. Right, and that's where bulk of the assist now is happening because the others were happening earlier as well, as you said. Yes. Right. Well, yeah, correct. I mean, so assist is happening because now I have the ability, ability to actually to. generate. Correct. And uh, just to go back to the point of rate of change of technology, a lot of it is of course still happening in the U.S. and overseas, right? I mean, so we are in a way taking technology from the, uh, from them. Is that a bit of a disadvantage? I mean, sitting here, uh, how does that happen? Because you're uh, in a way dependent, we're dependent on a lot of the sort of new innovation which is going on. Yeah, so actually, I mean, in a sense, you can argue that, I mean, so if you think about the future tech, uh, enterprise sort of architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, there are, there is this sort of the base core infrastructure, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. right? The core infrastructure is your compute, storage, network, all of that, so chips and the systems and so on. The above that is sort of the, the entire data management and the so-called foundational models right. that are actually being built um, at many places in the world now mm. and then lots and lots of open source models also. I believe that that's going to become the core infrastructure of the future. Right. right. A lot of the value will get generated above that infrastructure. Right. So I often call them so the, 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 uh, the, the foundational models, you can think of them as worldwide. Mm. But to utilize a worldwide model in the context of a business, mm. you'll have to go from worldwide to industry-wise, something mm. that knows about, let's say, insurance mm. or mortgage insurance. Mm. Sure. It's to industry a domain. very specific, yeah. yeah. So industry-wise to yeah. enterprise-wise, because the way I do what I do yeah. is slightly different than others. Right. And that's how I differentiate myself in the market. Right. To an activity-wise. So there are four different levels of, if you will, wiseness sure. or intelligence that sure. So something that is general knowledge, mm. industry specific knowledge, enterprise specific and activity specific. Right. So a lot of the, um, the innovation, if you will, mm. that will have to happen is to go from the foundational models that are generally worldwide, mm. all the way down to activity wise and then go back in the reverse direction to actually transform value, redefine sure. value chains and so sure. on. And, a lot of that is actually something that is happening in India or in services organizations. Is there, is like there, uh, is there a uh, sort of a case for being in the foundational level space as well? I, I mean, mean, there are pr examples where <laughs> we can do that, but in particular Indian languages. This is actually a good example where one, because of the corpora or the corpus okay. 
is where, so if you think about Indic languages and so on, that is where there is, I mean, the, 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 the what has been, hmm. other foundational models have been used, trained on more English and, English and so on. So, there is a case for it, hmm. but uh, there is a uh, lot, the, 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 the scale of value hmm. will come above the above base it. infrastructure. Hmm. So, it's not a, you're not at a disadvantage in that sense, I mean, the rate of change of technology, etc. I, mean, I don't think so. I think, I mean, should we be looking at the foundational model? Sure, there is no reason not to. Yeah. But at the same time, is that necessarily a, a sort of a prerequisite? It's no. not. It's not. Uh, now, another thing which uh, which I think uh, we should talk about is, is AI and these technologies deflationary in nature? Is it going to bring down, uh, so to speak, the bill of materials for Indian IT services companies? Uh, I just wanted to use your thoughts on it. No, I don't think so because uh, I think there is uh, every organization, uh, let's say every customer that PCS services, uh, they have more work to do than they have resources today. Okay. So it's not that there is a finite amount of work and we have reached that threshold. I mean, you go talk to almost any organization, they will have a long list of things that they would like to do that they are not able to do today because of lack of capacity or hmm. lack of funds available. So. Because this technology is going to enable people to do a lot more, mm. a lot more of that work will start actually getting done. Mm. And that is where it is likely to shift. So mm. I don't think that it is going to be deflationary. Mm. It so will actually allow people to do more. So yeah, but volume of work is going to expand, as you say, yes, there's a correct. long list of things people like to do. But I mean, the cost of doing it per se comes down. So you actually end up doing a lot more volume with, with a lot less. So in that sense, uh, especially for not just TCS, but otherwise for, I mean, as this becomes uh, main, more and more mainstream and we go to that third level that you spoke about, yeah. is it going to uh, have an impact on margins at which IT services companies operate at? I don't think so. In fact, I believe that it is an opportunity for us to actually rethink the value mm. that um, uh, as a services organization we are delivering to customers, right? Mm. So today, Primary value dimension is efficiency, right. where you essentially say that we can do this amount of work much more efficiently than you can do. Right. 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 Tomorrow, I believe that with this technology's infusion, if I can actually build a system where machines are augmenting people and people are augmenting machines, hmm. this sort of hybrid workforce, hmm. and I'm able, we are able to do more with the same, hmm. Not just more with the same, but more importantly, very high quality output by design, mm. then the mindset will shift from industrialization of work mm. to much more productization of work where I can commit to the quality of output I will deliver mm. and the time within which I will deliver that quality of output with by design, mm. then the pricing models, etc., will start shifting more towards the value-based pricing as mm. opposed to sort of ingredient-based pricing and so on and so forth. So that is where I believe the industry will evolve. Mm. And consequently, you will, in some sense, I would actually think that there is going to be greater opportunity mm. for us to create much greater value mm. for the customers and consequently impact the, the margins potentially in the positive way. Great to speak with you. It's been a fabulous conversation and thank you for taking out the time and sort of sharing all that perspective with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much.